good morning. How y'all doing? I'm sorry, y'all got just us again. We are really missing our band. Uh, they've all been busy, but uh, they'll all be back next week, though. So there's some good news. Y'all ready to sing a little bit? I'm going to teach a song to y'all so y'all can help us. Teach you your part. So your part will go like this. better than that. Here we go. Oh. Okay. Sing when I stop. Oh. <laughs> Do it again. We're the hardest part of living. There's no way you're gonna die. I'm trying to leave a legacy with only so much time. So I know that you really like it when Danny Green gets up here and writes jokes for you guys. So I wrote my own joke for you. I tested it out on Colin and Andrew, and one of them laughed. So we're about to see how it goes. If Jesus came back on a dinosaur, what would he come back on? A rapture. Okay. If you didn't laugh at my joke, you can just laugh at me. It's fine. Uh, guys, we have a lot of events coming up that we're super excited about, um, especially that Cross Brand Classic on the 28th. That's our biggest ranch rodeo of the year. 
And if you're not in it, you should be there just to see it because it's a huge wreck. People getting ran over by cows. It's wonderful. I love it. Um, it's, it's a great time. Uh, also, we have Easter coming up in a couple weeks, and our children's team is getting together. They're going to deliver over 800 eggs to the Eagle Creek community right up to 71, uh, but they do need your help. They have empty eggs, so they need some candy. So if y'all can go out this week and on Wednesday or next Sunday, come back and put some candy in the uh, boxes. There's one over here by the sale barn and then one in the foyer also, I believe, um, we would greatly appreciate that. If you are new and visiting with us this morning, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, if you go in the foyer, there's a guest services booth, and they have a gift for you. If you feel led to give this morning, you can do so by placing your donation in one of the barrels located around the room, uh, by texting 903-500-BEEF, or by going online to cbcctx.org. Will y'all pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for every individual that is in this room. And thank you for all of the gifts and all the versatility that you've blessed this church with, God. Um, I, I pray this morning that we remember that we're not trying to point people back to ourselves, but that we are trying to point people directly to you that we're not here for a performance, we're not here for a show, we're here to worship you and to remember the things that you have done and that you continue to do. And God, I pray that if someone came here this morning with a need, that they leave with that need met and that they leave leaning on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. All of my life in every season 
God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the harvest when favor and providence flow.
Father God, creator of the universe, we thank you. We thank you that you are the creator, that you are the sustainer, you are the redeemer. We thank you that we also call you Father, and we call you friend. And because you are creator, and because you sustain all things, we thank you. And we just pray your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours alone is the glory forever. Amen. You take what is and you about that thank you thank you you can have a seat
So I just want to take an opportunity to welcome everyone here. Uh, you folks that are online, howdy. Hey, y'all say hello to your online church. How about that? All right, online church, y'all need to be telling us that. And by the way, we're curious, which one of these uh, cameras do I need to gaze upon? Um, we want to know how many, am I looking at it? Um, we want to know how many are watching at your house, because we know like, like there's 82 of y'all, it says online, but we know, and we even want to know those of you that are watching us in your drawers, it's okay, just tell us, we know you are. I had, um, uh, one of my Texas Ranger friends, I, I had no longer, I mean, I just stepped off stage and I got a text from a Texas Ranger friend of mine that says, I'll have you know I'm fully dressed. <laughs> so, we are excited that you're here this morning. I would uh, uh, say that, you know, our, our whole life is full of, you know, intersects, right? The intersections with people. Uh, in Scripture, it's called providence. God is constantly setting up people. He's setting up uh, uh, things and and. Just circumstances, right? It's never an accident. It's never fate. God is all about this. And so several years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Ray Barron, Ray and Cherry. And he, that we have become great friends. So blessed to have him in our life. And lo and behold, boy, uh, they just connected to Crossbrand and um, has been in leadership. But one of the things Ray does in his other world, you know, he's ex-military. God has brought all these people into Ray's life. Of course, now he's in the private security business, and one of the intersects in Ray's life was with the man that I'm uh, about to have Ray introduce. Uh, they were at Holly Tree last night, so it's, if you can look around, you can see that this is definitely not Holly Tree Country Club, all right? And, it, and if we don't get some air conditioner on, it's not going to smell like Holly Tree. Wherever Brett is or Bo or somebody, we need some AC on uh, um, they don't let me touch that anymore. Um, so I'm going to have Ray come out and introduce. Listen, y'all have been privileged this year to have some great speakers on this stage, but I'm telling you right now, this guy is incredible. He's got an incredible story. I hope you'll listen to it. If you're on Facebook, please share this because Ray's about to introduce one of our warriors. Hey guys, I'm sure some of y'all saw the social media posts and who's here today and a lot of you this may be your first time here or even first time walking into a church. So first we welcome you here. Um, as he said, in the protection business, we get to watch over a lot of people, but it's very seldom that we get to watch over somebody that we actually believe in their mission. And your guest today, Victor Marks with the ministry All Things Possible, his mission um, with his wife, with his team of people that they brought today is pretty incredible. And if you haven't read his full story, please go online or they've got resources in the back before you leave. Grab it because it is a true story of forgiveness, redemption, and how God uses anybody to accomplish some pretty big things. Let me pray and then we'll get started. So, Father, I thank you for again for this morning. I thank you for just this weekend being able to meet this team of people. And, God, we do say it's not about Victor. It's, it's not about him. It is about what you've done in him, what you're doing through him, and what you're going to continue to do through him. And, God, we pray over every person sitting in a seat or standing in this building, that even whether they're a believer or not, no matter what happens today as they walk out of those doors changed in some way. God, your spirit just needs to move, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And we are in uh, northwest Mosul. You can't burn me. I'm the igniter. There's ISIS plenty around. 
Uh, we were able to deliver some powdered milk for babies. If I had a cow, I could just set up a little stand. <laughs> Well, thank y'all, and good morning. It's great to be here. Um, how many, just so I know, are visiting for the first time here? Raise your hand. Wow. Well, it's fantastic. We welcome you. Whatever I say or do, please don't hold it against the pastor or the staff. I'm a visitor. And so is my dog. Get up. So let's get the dog thing out the way. Any dog lovers out there? All right. Look at that scout. They're so friendly. Scout is a uh, Belgian Malinois. And she's on our team. As you saw, she was in the video. And she's one of the few dogs that actually face ISIS fighters, nose to nose, and then would allow women or children that would recover to help get out of an air to hold and hug uh, as a therapy dog. So she does both. She's multi-purpose. I tell people she's a therapy dog. That bites. That bites. Actually, I think it's how Christians should be. Uh, would you like to see her bite? We got a center in the background that we need to apply a little pressure. No, we'll do we'll do a little uh, bite demo for you. Come on. Oh. oh. Uh. Sir, this dog is a sin center detection dog. And she's keying on you. There's some sin you must repent of. <laughs> all right uh, all right ready take good take there you go there you go that don't hit oh don't try to hit my dog she'll switch up on you just like that she's a highly trained dog good oh whoa yeah don't scout scout out through that let's go boots up Hey, yeah, come here, Fui. <laughs> Fui. 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 Seats. Plots. Plots. Steak. And there you go. Just get sure that's a dessert. Good. Good. All right. Hey, have you had enough? Scout. Scout. How much sin do you have in you, sir? This is, I mean, she's, she's trying to purify you. Let's go. Out. Look. All right, let's give my lovely decoy a big hand. <laughs> well, that was fun. Yeah, I'm not joking when I say definitely Christian men should be the type that aren't mean but should be dangerous. In our country, we need men to be masculine, moral, and we need an increase of manhood in our country. Anybody else agree with me? Uh, all right. Mean, no, dangerous, yes. Well, it's really great to be here. I, I'm so thankful for the opportunity. The first, uh, the first service was unreal. I mean, y'all some good people up here in this country. I can talk freely. I always do, but I never get invited back much. 
I got a feeling I may be invited back here. Uh, that's the difference. I'm, I'm grateful, and I welcome everybody watching uh, on social media. I was just told that we've linked y'all's live service to our social media, and it's, I think we have somewhere around, around 400,000 people uh, on that. So uh, Cowboy Church is getting known in a bigger, bigger, bigger way. Which I think y'all have some lessons to be taught to the rest of our country. This is one of the last strongholds, not only in Texas, of conservative ideas as a county, but actually in the whole country. Do y'all realize that? I mean, it is important that y'all realize how essential and critical y'all are to not only the state of Texas, but to America. If there's not great examples, people will drift. If there's not a standard that's set, people will drift. To whoever's loudest, to whoever's pushing the most pressure. And I'm telling y'all, this is why you have to safeguard your marriages. That's why you have to have your homes be homes that serve the Lord. And we're not talking about perfection here. We're just talking about the right direction. Because our country is steering off in the wrong direction. This last election... I travel all over the country, and I can tell you, we found out who were real churches, who were real preachers, who were real people willing to stand for the gospel, and those who weren't. And y'all are people that do. You stand uncompromising because you got a pastor like y'all do, because you got a staff. And and you know what? The bar is set high here because it's biblical. I have people that I have respected and known for decades that were quiet about the election. That never said, if that person gets in the office, there are many babies that are going to die. And ultimately, isn't life worth protecting? I don't know how a Christian can be quiet when it comes time for electing people who are in favor of of killing a child, even full term. You see what we do? We've helped so many kids all around the world. I would be a hypocrite if I didn't stand and fight for kids in America. We do counter sex trafficking. We do counter pedophile work. That's one of the patches on my dog. It says pedophile hunter. (laughs) You can see people who see that and go, I'm going to go this way. (laughs) So you see other people that go, I like that patch. You guys, we're active with what we do all the time, protecting kids, both here in the U.S. and overseas. You know what we need most from a group like y'all? Prayer. We need people to really pray. And if you want to be serious about it, I think we have... Uh, maybe at the table, an email sign-up list where sign up for email. You want to get solid news? How many of you are tired of having to live through crazy stuff? Uh, our team, we have analysts, we have, you know, monster hunters. We, we have a daily intelligence brief that is free if you go get on it right now. Some of you are on it. We'll drop it in your inbox every morning. It's the best analysis of news and what's going on and you need to know of. Every day. And I tell you, get on that. You can do it at my website, victormarks.com forward slash brief. We have over 70,000 people on it right now. I'm telling you, communication is key when it comes time for fighting against darkness. Don't you see what they've done in our nation? Big tech, social media, they've controlled the narrative. And you have to go beyond the people and look to a higher level It is a war between good and evil. It is a war between God's kingdom and the kingdom of darkness. And Christians, you got to wake up and believe it's real every day. If not, the enemy will use anesthesia of pleasure, of apathy to get you to just go, well, it'll be okay as long as I got me and mine. No. Uh, I've got a friend who... uh, (laughs) I've got people ask me all the time, 
Like I had one pastor go, hey, things are getting a little rough. I said, yep. He goes, uh, I got a thousand rounds. Is that enough? I said, enough for what, my friend? He goes, you know, I mean, and Tifa and all them people, they, you know, they come marauding around. I, I th- I'm ready. I said, a thousand, a thousand rounds. I said, how many do you plan on killing? He goes, I don't know. As many as it takes. And this is a non-military guy who hadn't experienced. Uh, he's just scared. And I said, just shoot one and leave them there. They'll blow it up like a cow and start smelling and the rest won't want to come around. <laughs> he goes, I never thought about that. <laughs> I said, brother, me and my family have lived the apocalypse. We've lived the zombie attack because we lived in Iraq during ISIS fighting. Remember when ISIS was doing all the beheading on TV and we were terrified? Guess what? We advanced toward them. We went and got a safe house there. God called us to go and start helping those who've been affected most by And it got real, really fast, really fast. We've been reaching kids here in the U.S. for a long time, kids who are incarcerated, kids who are struggling, kids who've been sex trafficked. And then the Lord opened a door for us to go to Iraq when ISIS invaded, was killing and kidnapping and using girls for sex trade. It's horrible, horrible. And when I put the team together, and I, I, you know, I, I put together a very good security team because we were on our own. Now, a lot of us are former everything from, I served in the Marine Corps, uh, actually a while back, I served under, my commander in chief was President Ronald Reagan. How's that? The, when I tell young warriors that, they're like, oh, Ronald Reagan? I go, yeah, we were using gunpowder and, you know, flint locks. <laughs> Roll the wagons, yeah. Charge. <laughs> but I thank God that the training I had in the Marine Corps served me well to where we deployed as a high-risk missionary team at 50 years old. How's that? Hey. That's only people in Geritol clapping. It works. Hey, 14 times overseas, over 90 missions, and to date we've helped over 43,000 kids and women. 43,000. I believe Christians of all people should be the one that runs toward the chaos, that advances toward the craziness, to bring order in the middle because God Almighty is with us. He said, if I'm with you, who can be against you? Right? Uh, Greater is... He that's in you than he that's in this world. And we definitely keep a world view of the demonic over God fighting. But the Lord says, engage. Nowhere in this Bible can you show me where it says be safe. That's one of the tricks of the enemy. Hey, be safe. You, yours, that's it. Don't just, eh. And then you know what? Next thing you know, you're not only safe, you're ineffective. Because you're limiting what you feel like God will tell you to do. Some of you, it just starts with your money. You're like, I just got to, if I just keep my money and how many coffee cans do you need in the backyard full of them? It is an incredible life to live fully committed to Jesus Christ, to say, Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, however you want me to live, I will live for you. You've saved me. I have eternity in mind, so let's just do it. Full throttle. And I live with a woman that lives that out. She's a full throttle. When it's, when, <laughs> when it's our time to go to heaven, she's like, I don't want any oil in my lamp. I want it gone. And I'll prove it to you. The first team I put together, we're going to head over to Iraq. Our mission was to help 30 young ladies that had been held captive. Very high-risk mission. So I put together a bunch of former guys from 
Marines to SEALs to Rangers to even a Delta Force guy. And did I say SEALs? Yeah, I had a SEAL. You, you got you to gotta put one SEAL on the team in case there's cameras or something, you know. <laughs> Photo op, get the SEAL. It's like, dude, why do you have flippers when we're in Iraq? You never know. Whatever. So we're prepared. We're getting ready. We're training. We're getting ready. And my wife comes up to me. She goes, honey, I've been praying, and I feel like I'm supposed to go with you. I said, no, you're not. She goes, I don't know. I think the Lord told me I'm supposed to go. She said with such a confidence, it made me mad. Husbands, anybody ever got that? You know they're hearing from the Lord because they're praying and reading the Bible more than you. Don't try to pull rank on them when they're doing the daily. And you're like, well, I did go to church last Sunday before Easter. I doubled down. I went to your wife's got that every day. She's a my wife said, I said, no, that, that's not going to work. Talked to the security team. I said, my wife is just talking smack. They're like, no way, boss. You cannot bring your wife on a mission. We, You know, we're going to be going. Away. What are you going to do, look for your wife? I was like, uh. So we got fussing over it. You ever fuss in your marriage? Yeah, we got fussing. I said, okay, why in the world do you want to go? She goes, well, I know you'll find those girls. She made me feel good. I'm like, yes, we will. <laughs> and she goes, but when you find them, you can't hug them. But I can. And they'll need hugging. I said, oh, my goodness. I looked at her and said, you, you want to risk your life just to hug girls who've been held captive as sex slaves and abused beyond what most could even imagine. She goes, what's the worst that can happen? We die? And I was like, yes. Yes, die, die. Death, 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 die. You know her response? Well, then don't we win? I was like, well, you really believe this stuff. I mean, like, at a whole different level. I mean, I, I know I'm going to heaven, but I mean, I want it to be when I'm in a rocking chair, you know, blankets and beer. and a, No, I'm just, <laughs> woo, fishing. I go, wow, you, you're, you really are that committed. She goes, the number of our days are in his book. Why are we going to worry? We leave everything up to him. We just follow him. That's who I'm married to, gentlemen. That's who I'm married to. She's a woman with the attitude of, because huh, there's been some missions I, I was like, this one looks really bad. She's like, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> She's like, you come back with your shield or on it. And she has literally expressed, I would rather, and her, I mean, her feeling is, honey, I would rather, I'd rather be a widow than married to a coward. You follow the Lord and do what he tells you to do. Do you know what that makes me want to do? Climb mountains, swim seas, and slay the dragons all day long. Women, if you knew the influence you could have on your man, if you stopped nagging him for a second. <laughs> we are so privileged as Christians to be given directives to run in the lane each of us are. You don't have to go overseas to serve God. You can do it right here in Smith County. You can do it right there in your kitchen raising kids. You know, I had the privilege of meeting Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham Bell. And, and I never forget, my wife was back home. I was up at the training center. And I remember meeting her, and I was like, oh, my gosh, it's you. You know, missionary kid, brave, courageous woman, great mom. 
Franklin messed with her one time, so she put him in the trunk, <laughs> drove him to town. L- love that woman. She knew how to parent. Her parenting advice, she said, if we trained our kids like we trained our dogs, we'd have better kids, which just means consistency, 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 not losing your temper. And I remember telling her, I said, my wife, oh, my gosh, she would love to have met you, but she's she's back home. She goes, she is. I go, yeah, we just had another baby, and she's back home. And then I said, is there any way I, you could say something to my wife? I have a video camera. She's like, well, sure. So I pulled it out, and it was a while back, so it was like. <laughs> Roll it. And I'll never forget, she just said, Eileen, sweetie, you are doing the right thing by staying home with your kids and being a mom for them. That's what they need most. That's what you're called to do. And she honored my wife for wanting to be a mom. A mom is one of the greatest positions you could ever hold. Because if you aren't raising your kids, somebody else will. Don't think the church needs to raise them. Are you going to drop off your kids for one, two hours a week and expect them to have course corrections? Give me a break. Most youth pastors aren't even married. They got 200 kids. What are they going to do with that? That's, that's no, it's the responsibility lies on us. And look, you don't even have to do parenting great. I'm not a great dad, probably because I didn't have one. At least that's the excuse I have. But I never stopped trying. Does that make sense? I mean, I remember we were driving down the road one time. It was here in Texas. Because I actually, we lived in Texas for a while. That's where we had our last baby. We had, so we have a Texas baby. You know, we did that right. And uh, one of my kids was on that cell phone. You know, I said, hey, put that up. Disobey me. Put that cell phone up. i never forget. She goes, this is mine. I did a quick little calculation. I'm pretty sure I'm paying for that minutes and data and plan. So I just reached back there, grabbed the snap and half rolled on the window and threw it out. <laughs> Kept driving. I, I know it's bad for the environment, but it gave road workers, job security. (laughs) Victor Marx is around here. I told my kids, hey, as far as me and my house, we want to serve the Lord. We're not great at perfection, but we are good at going the right direction. It doesn't have to look pretty, but it's, we're going to just try to honor God. I told my kids, don't play any filthy music. Remember when music went from kind of fun and then innocuous into really profane lyrics? where it had to have explicitives and don't, you know, warning labels. Now, look how far we've gone. I mean, at the Grammys, they're honoring Cardi B for nasty music and saying, but Dr. Seuss, we can't allow. Where is our country gone? We're so upside down. And that's a frown. Green eggs and am. I am, I am. <laughs> you don't want to even want me to start reciting Cardi B lyrics. And yet Christian kids and people naming the name of Christ are listening to that junk. Starts in our home. Parents, you're not to be your kid's best friend. They got best friends. You need to be a parent. And you look them squarely in the eye and say, look, you don't even have to agree with me, but you got to trust me. I'm trying to help build your moral warehouse because you're going to need it in this very treacherous world. And you can't just tell your kids, no, no, no. You got to tell them the why, why, why. If you listen to this, if you partake of this, you're going to program your mind, and it goes against what the Word of God says. Now, I'm not a legalist in any way, but boy, I do have a standard. And people talk about, well, we have to have unity. I go, I, I don't have to have unity with anybody if it causes compromise. I can just simply disagree. And people are like, well, you got to work with people who I said, 
if they don't believe in the standard of truth, where can I go with it? So an example, I came home probably earlier than I should have. My kids weren't expecting me. And I walked in. They had a bunch of friends, high schoolers up in the game room area with a big boom box that I had bought. And they are blaring, F-bombing craziness. And I remember walking in, heard it. I've learned it's better not to react. but to respond. And I tell you what, I've <laughs> it's easier to respond better even in combative situations when ice is shooting at you because it matters. Everything matters. So you're responding well. But you get around your kids, you react, you know, you're like, ah! <sighs> Take a breath, respond. So I walked up the stairs. I walked into the big game room. They were all like, <laughs> I said, yeah, that's, that's not going to work. I calmly walked over and grabbed the box that I bought, unplugged it from the wall that was providing electricity that I pay. I walked down my stairs of the house I'm paying for into my front yard that I mow and actually have paid, and the deed, it's in my name, or oh, and the boss at Applesauce. I put it down, went in the little work shed, came out, poured gas on it. Backed up. And you know how plastic burns? It was good, and it was a good one. I mean... My kids came running down. They're all at the front door. No, Mom, Dad's going crazy again. And then she mumbled like, he don't have to go. He's already there and should have listened to him. And, uh, and while my kids are just freaking out going, this is so embarrassing. These, our friends are going to think he's nuts. What were their friends doing? Your dad is so cool. That's crazy, man. He is burning that. We like him. I was like, I burn stuff all the time. Bring me yours. I, you know, kids need parents, not friends right now. This world is pulling at them so hard. And the battle's in the mind. Hey, teenagers, listen to me. Especially you two right there. I'm joking. But I'm going to go over here. He looks kind of mean. <laughs> Young people, listen to me. If there's one piece of advice I can give you all especially during the teenage years, trust your parents, especially when you disagree with them. You're not going to agree with them all the time. If you do, it's kind of weird. You've been brainwashed and parents, good on you, but it's going to be a hard life because they're going to stay in your basement <laughs> forever and ever. And <laughs> now listen. Kids, trust your parents. They've made it through the minefield of life. This is a hard life. And remember I said the enemy is out to destroy you? Teenagers, the enemy is out to destroy you. What's one thing we always kind of link to teenage years? Rebellion. Teenage rebellion. Do you know that's what the evil one did? He rebelled against God. He is after teenagers. He's after kids. It's more than just hormones. It's a demonic scheme to destroy your life. I'll give you an example. Here in Texas, my wife and I, we, we reached, there were years we reached every kid who's been incarcerated in the state of Texas. Went to all the juvenile facilities. We've handwritten thousands of kids who wrote us. Heck, y'all, Texas Youth Commission made us volunteer of the year because we were just, oh, my gosh. But there was one facility we went to, all-girls facility. I'll never forget going in there, a group of teenage girls, and I'm going to lead them in a little Bible study. And they were hard. These were like really tough girls. They were like, hmm. And uh, I'm used to tough. My first experience going into a juvenile facility, I was nervous, and somebody invited me. This was in Colorado. And I'll come back to the girl, but man, 
I walked in there, there were 75 kids sitting on a concrete floor looking at me like this. What are you going to talk about, white wonder bread? <laughs> that, that was just the girls. And I was like, oh, tough crowd. I was so nervous. The guy told me, well, do your martial arts thing because I have a martial arts background. We taught martial arts for years. I hold a world record as the fastest gun that's on. You can see it online, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to do my little thing. So I had a guy hold two pencils in his hand and one in his mouth. I took out the nunchucks and I swung and knocked out the first one. Boom, knock out the second one. I went to knock out the third one. It didn't turn out the way I wanted it. I overshot it, hit him on his chin, and split him open. And I was, I instantly blamed God because that's what you do, right? When you, you wanted me to come here, now look what you've done. God. <laughs> And this guy was bleeding, and he was like, ah. And then I still swung it again and knocked it out the second time. I would never hit anybody accidentally like that. So I was like, oh, my gosh. And yet, when I thought I had blew it, those 75 kids sitting there all hard, then they went from this to this. <laughs> They're like, this dude is crazy. This, this preacher, man, he's, he's making them bleed. And all of a sudden, I got real bold. I was like, that's right. We're going to talk about the law today. <laughs> watch out, watch out, watch out. <laughs> and, you know, end up getting to pray for those kids. When I asked them, how many of you want to surrender your life to Christ and follow the Lord? 53 out of the 75 raised their hand and then stood. I was like, did they miss something? Did do they think they get out today? I was like, no, no y'all don't get out. I don't know what y'all, what angle y'all working on. We're talking about following Christ, being a disciple, being forgiven. Had them sit down, 53 sit up again. I was like, oh, my goodness. And then the wildest thing happened. And, you know, people always wonder, well, how do you know the Lord's telling you to do something? How do you, well, one, the Holy Spirit can speak it right to you. Two, the Word of God will confirm it and direct you. Three other people may speak to confirm it, but when God's really showing you something, you'll know. Attune your ear to him. Don't make excuses. And I remember after that day going, oh, my gosh, I knew the Lord was calling us to start reaching those that very few want to reach. You know why? Back up three months earlier, my bride and I, who's sitting right over there, love you, honey. We're out on a date. Now, this is many years ago. We were pregnant for our fourth one, our fourth baby. She was all, I mean, she was really pregnant. And we were leaving the mall. A carload of kids pull up next to us, thumping music. And they're, you can tell they're gangbangers. And I was like, oh, my. As a kind where you're like, just look forward. Just look forward. And I felt like I heard the Holy Spirit say, talk to them, tell them. Tell them about me. I was like, I rebuke that voice right now. That's, uh-uh. And I was like, no. I was like, ugh. My wife can tell when I'm struggling with the Lord. She doesn't struggle. She just does it. She's like just brazen. Boom. It's God Almighty talking to you. Suck it up, buttercup. Do the deal. I was like, uh, all right. So she rolls down the window, and then she, mm, she kind of just, I'm like, fine. So I bumped the horn. The kid looked at me and said, hey, man, pull over. I want to talk to you. He goes, I ain't pulling over. He turned his music up. I was like, Lord, your servant was willing. Bless me now. <laughs> Don't justify those. I was like, shortcuts. And I felt like the Lord said, you do it because I have the gift of antagonism. So I bumped the horn again. He looks up. He goes, what? I said, pull over. I want to talk to you. He goes, man, we ain't pulling over. I said, you afraid of an old man? <laughs> Me and my little mini band. <laughs> got out. They popped out as four of them. They start walking toward me. I'm walking toward them. I'm like, now what, Lord? Now what? What, what do I say? And all I could come up with was stop. Stop. They stopped. I said, I saw you having a knife in the back seat. A guy had a big butterfly knife, a balisong knife. That's all I could come up with, observational awareness, right? 
like, stop. He goes, what, you, you a cop? I was like, in third grade, I was a cross guard. <laughs> I had a whistle. And a, no, not a cop. I said, but I'm a master of martial arts. I've trained over 30 world champions. I've worked with special operations teams. I've trained warriors to go into places and put bad people away. And I want to show you how to open and close the knife the right way. For whatever the reason, it convinced him. <laughs> he went back, goes in the back seat, reaches, pulls it out, brings it to me, and then I do a quick demonstration. Susie handed it to me. I started twirling, spinning, open, closing up, closer, and then I stabbed him in his neck. I was like, now, now who's, no, you don't do that. Let me, let me pull it out. You can't stab people when you're trying to witness to the Lord. It's, it hurts the witnessing process most of the time. So, now this guy, they were impressed with what I did. And I said, let me tell you why I really pulled you over. To share the true master that I serve, Jesus Christ. And you know, by the time we were finished, three of the four kids let me pray for them. And when it was just going so great, a kid walked up off the street, friends of theirs. He had big wavy hair. And he starts cussing me. And, and then he charges me. He wants to fight. And they actually grab him, pull him back. And they're saying, hey, man, he's cool. I'm like, listen to them. <laughs> and he kept saying, don't you talk about God. Don't you talk about the, if God was a, the stuff that happened to me, he wouldn't have. And I, and I realized he was, he was angry out of pain. I said, young man, I understand more than you think. But let me tell you, the way you feel doesn't change the truth of God's word. He loves you. And he can change you. I ended up getting in the car and leaving, and Eileen was like, what was that? I was like, I don't know. You weren't praying enough. So <laughs> eating her popcorn. Let's see what happens. <laughs> now, my wife prays. She is an intercessor. Or I wouldn't be here today. Trust you me. Well, fast forward three months. I'm in that youth prison, 75 kids, 53, except Christ. One of them on the back row who had raised his hand and stood, guess what? It was the kid with the big hair. He had got arrested and he was incarcerated and he raised his hand and we were handing out our Bibles. I was like, man. And I saw him and I said, hey, you remember me? And he was looking down and he goes, yeah, I remember you. I said, look at you, you're in jail now. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't say that. that. That's not good witnessing. That's, that's horrible. <laughs> and I said, uh, I got to ask you, man, why today? Why did you give your life to the Lord today? And he just goes, you said Jesus Christ wanted to live his life through us. And he goes, I'm tired of living my life for myself. I want him to live it through me. I thought, wow, there are some churches where Christians need to hear this. Now, that's what I knew the Lord was saying. You need to do the work I'm calling you to. It's new. It's different. And you need to embrace it. Go full throttle. That's when I stepped off of staff from Focus on the Family with Dr. James Dobson. I was actually an assistant to Doc. And then we just poked a hole in the boat and said, Lord, we're going to follow you. Now, go back to that girl's prison. Those girls there. I'm teaching a little Bible study. One of the girls, this is proof that there's a huge spiritual war and that you need to be aware of it. One of those girls starts growling while I'm teaching. I'm like, that's more than a bad breakfast. And then she starts swinging. And then she starts yelling out in this man's voice, this dark, evil voice. And then she starts clawing herself. I back up. All the girls back up. And then the guards are backing up, and I'm backing up more. I'm like, how far we got to go back? Y'all look like y'all been here. And the guard goes, do something. I don't know, you do something. You know, this is your job. He, he, he literally goes, no, no, that's the evil. The stuff comes on her. You're a preacher. I'm like, I'm not even a good one. I don't, don't be labeling me. <laughs> And everybody's looking at me. I'm like, mm. I said, uh, all right, check it up, Buckcrap. Here we go. I said, uh, hey, 
I'm like, okay, hey, well, go put her in her cell. Let's, and when I said cell, I meant put her in there and shut the door. They did, they just put her in there. And I walk up, the door's not shut. I'm like, ooh, can I shut it? She's like, Argh. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I said, Lord, Lord, I don't know what to do. Okay, I, di- boop, it's go time. It's like a person who acts like they know how to fight until it's time to fight. Poof, you get hit, and it's like, hey, I don't think I want to fight. Well, you talk a lot. That's how Christians are in spiritual stuff. I know a lot. Hey, get, confront a demon. You just find out where you are. And this girl had a demon. And I was like, Lord, Lord, what do I do? And I started thinking about Jesus and his encounters with the demons and the guy of the garden. You know, the, I thought, okay, we need pork. We need some pigs. We, y'all got pigs up here on this? No pigs? I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to put a demon. Y'all got any bacon? You got turkey sausage. I'll take anything right about now. I'm like, what is wrong with you? I don't know what I'm doing. That's what's wrong. So I, next thing I thought, okay, I have to use authority. And I asked the demon his name. I said, demon? And it looked up at me and snarled. I said, what is your name? And then he goes, I am Satan. I get scared like in the wrong times. And when it's really bad, the Holy Spirit puts funny thoughts in my mind. (laughs) I don't know if it's because I got a strong back and a weak mind and it's easier. But it's like, when he said Satan, you know what came to my mind? You're not the real Satan. You're probably some little little S, not no capital S. You're trying to use your boss's name. You're probably some demon of insecurity. You pull back the veil. It's a little bitty demon with a microphone. I am Satan. <laughs> no, you're not. I said, knock it off. I said, I don't care. I don't. And the demon said some other things about me that no one would know. I was like, okay, I'm impressed. So I want to talk to the girl. That's how you have to do with demons. Zero fear. Zero fear. The Bible says perfect love cast out fear. And I love this girl. Didn't even know her, but I felt God's love for her. I'm like, demon, be quiet. I want to talk to the girl. And then the little girl came back. She's 15 years old. She goes, hi. I go, hi. Are you aware that, you know, <laughs> she, she's like, yes. I said, you are? Oh, okay. She goes, yeah. He comes and goes. I'm like, oh, all right. Well, what are we going to do? I said, let me just talk to you. And then I talked to her about her past. She said, my dad, my dad was a Satanist. And he dedicated me to the Satan. And he taught me about demons. So I accept them. They give me power. They make me feel like I have a friend. And it scares everybody. I said, you do know that demon wants to kill you. Because that's the work of the enemy, to steal, kill, and destroy and I said, do you want to get rid of him? She goes, no. I said, oof. I said, okay. I said, well, I'm going to come back tomorrow, but do you mind if I have people pray for you? And she said, no, fine. I went, I started texting, emailing. We were young in the ministry, and I was just like, hey, pray. There's a girl, and then, yeah, and then, and there's no pigs, and we need, it's okay, kind of, you know. And people started praying. I came in that next day. The guards go, she's waiting for you. I said, oh. Is it she or he? I just need a heads up, know what I'm getting into. They're like, no, no, it's her. I said, okay. I went back there, and there she was. And her name is Christy. I said, Christy. She goes, I can't. I have not slept that good in years. I slept so peaceful. I said, people were praying for you because prayer works. And then guess what? I just said, is today the day you want to be free from darkness? Listen to what she said. She looked directly in my eyes and said, 
If I surrender my life to the light, are you Christians going to forget about me? Because he won't. And he'll come back for me. It caught me so off guard, I had to just think for a moment. I said, this is what I can promise you. I will never forget you. And I will tell people about you, Christy. She said, okay. So we prayed, and I, I remember sitting down. She's at the door. She grabs my fingers, her little hands. She was in an orange jumpsuit, and I started praying, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray against all demonic forces that you would free this girl from any demonic activity in life. And right about there, her body arched up, and she started squeezing my hands so hard, I actually started praying faster. And Lord, we just thank you for this day and the food. Bless it in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I was like, that was a lot of demon strength right there. Her tears started hitting her little orange jumpsuit, and she was free. She was free. She never went back to jail after she got out. And there's some radical things that happened. But now that 15-year-old is in her 30s. You guys, what an awesome, incredible opportunity we each have to run in the lane that God has called us to run. The biggest thing that will keep you back, in my opinion, is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness has plagued the church, which will make you, <laughs> you can't be a conduit for God's love because your heart is hard. You got to forgive. It's the last story, and I know I'm going long, but this is it. My life as a kid, and the reason why I do what I do is I was abused as a kid. I was sexually abused. I was physically and emotionally abused. My mom married six times. My biological dad, he didn't claim me as his kid when my mom was pregnant. He ended up being a drug dealer and a pimp and a practicing warlock. I went to 14 schools, 17 houses. I did drugs starting in the sixth grade. And I had a lot of emotional problems because of what I went through. I ended up having to go to a trauma specialist 123 times in nine months. I've been on Depakote, Depakine, Prozac, Lost, all these drugs, Xanax. They, they, they said I was bipolar too, an ultra rapid cycler. The psychiatrist looked at me and said, You will never. Be normal. You'll never fully function. And I remember thinking, well, I never function fully anyway, so keep paying your student loan, doc. <laughs> I got the gift of sarcasm. The greatest thing that's helped me besides coming to know Jesus Christ is being set free from all demonic activity in my life through stronghold, praying against. And I think when we come next time, that we'll offer to pray for people who feel like they may have demonic strongholds in their life and just need to be set free. Doesn't mean you're possessed, but means you're targeted by an assignment of the wicked one or even your children. We see people get set free and their lives change. But it starts with forgiveness. You've got to clear your heart out first so the enemy can't get a foothold. Anger turns into bitterness. Bitterness will ruin you. The man that abused me was my stepfather. And ultimately, I was abused and left for dead in a commercial cooler. You can read the book. You can watch the film. It's in 15 languages on, on YouTube, on our website. The thing that God asked me to do that set me free was to forgive my stepfather. So I found him. And when I found him, I was the one who actually brought him to the hospital when he was dying. And he was a mean, mean dude. You know what? I was there and I said, hey, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. 
according to God's word, you have rejected Jesus Christ in a way where he has died on the cross for you, but you, you've rejected him. I said, do you mind if I read the Bible to you? He said, go ahead, do it if you want. And I'll read scripture to him every day about the cross and death and eternity. And the last time I'd see him, the night before, about 4 a.m., me and my wife got out of bed, and we started praying for him to the point of weeping that God would save his soul because I didn't even want him to go to hell. I recognized it was something more sinister. And he wasn't my real enemy. It was the demonic. I went into the hospital the next morning. He had a new nurse, and he said, hey, nurse, this is my son. I was shocked. He goes, he became kind of like a preacher. <laughs> I was like, that's true, kind of. I'm not really good at it. But I'm working on it. <laughs> and he said, uh, he's been worried about my eternity, but he didn't have to worry anymore. I gave my life to the Lord last night. I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But then I realized in that moment, this is exactly why God brought me here. You know, forgiveness is giving up your right to hurt someone back for hurting you. It's not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of courage. And you're trusting in the Lord. Doesn't mean you trust them. Doesn't mean you're necessarily reconciled to somebody. But you need to let go of that. And then I said, Lord, I'm done. What do you want me to say to him? And I knew the Holy Spirit told me, just tell him you love him. And I said, Dad, I love you. And he looked up at me and he said, boy, I love you too. Then I took this pillow. <laughs> and, uh, what? I lifted his head and put it by. Fluffed it. Fluffed the pillow. I tell people it was a Mike Lindell pillow. I met Mike the other day. I was like, Mike. If you have any bitterness to your heart or unforgiveness, you ought to release it today. Trust God. If justice needs to happen, I'm all for justice on this earth. Ask ISIS. Ask pedophiles that we've captured. That our ministry has stepped in a way to assist law enforcement and specialized teams around the world to find very bad monsters to protect children. But I'm telling you, more than anything, you need the forgiveness of God if you've never received him as your Savior. And you need to follow him like a disciple. That's your surety of salvation. Anything less is not a fulfillment of life. It's a form of religion that won't really serve you well. Does that make sense? We need you in the battle. All of you, fully committed to the Lord so he can do great things in and through you, starting in your own home, because that's where the battle often starts. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for today. And God, it's a moment of salvation. It, Lord, I know you're here, and I know your Holy Spirit is hovering over people, convicting them of sin, of falling short, Lord, of unforgiveness. And even those watching. And I pray if you're watching, listening, or here right now, if God is speaking to your heart, the best thing you can do is respond in trust and obedience and say, Lord, forgive me and surrender your life to him. Trust him. You don't have to come to him perfect. He did that on the cross. You just have to come to him honest and just say, Lord, forgive me. I, I, I'll follow you. If that's you and you want me to pray for you, I'll do it right now. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to know who you are. If you'd say, Victor, please pray for me. Lift your hand up real high so I can see who you are. God bless you and you and you and you and y'all, all of you there, here, 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 over here, God bless you. Anybody else, God bless you. In the back, right there in the middle, on the side, good. God bless you right here. 
Praise the Lord. This is good stuff. God bless you in the back. Good. God bless you. Young person, I love it. Anyone else? St. Victor, that's me. I need to surrender everything. God bless you too, young lady. That's incredible. I uh, bless you in the back. Gotcha. If you're here today and you say, Victor, I, I God bless you. If you say, Victor, I, God bless you, man. Good. I need to forgive some people. I need to give up my right to hurt people for hurting me back. Now, hey, it's just an act of your will. God will give you the grace to do it. And it certainly doesn't mean they deserve it, but neither do we. We don't deserve forgiveness from God, but he gave it to us. If that's you, I'll pray for you. Lift your hand up real high. Yeah, God bless y'all. Just say, yeah, help me. to. I need to forgive some people. God bless y'all. God bless you. Some of you need to do it just because of the drive over here this morning in the car. Good Lord. All right, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done here today. Thank you for those that are watching and listening, that are responding to you, God. And I pray in the name of Jesus, you would make these people born again. You would cleanse them from all their sin. You, Lord, that you would give them a new heart. You would put your spirit in them and do in and through them what they can't do for themselves. Lord, thank you for the cross that it's enough for all of us. All of our sin, anything we could possibly do, Lord. And God, thank you as those who surrender to you to say, I want to forgive. I want to give up my right to hurt people for hurting me back. Give them the grace they need to walk in that truth and that act of forgiveness. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastor, the staff. God, may this continue to be a lighthouse on a hill, not only for this area, this county, the city of Tyler, which is a short drive away, but, Lord, for the state and the nation, that a people whose heart is toward the God and love the Lord, they can do great and mighty things in his name for his glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, you guys. Let's give Victor one more round of encouragement and gratitude. You bet. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Victor. Also, there's some books at the back. Stop there. But I want to say something real quick on to the online audience. Uh, uh, we just want you to know that if you've got any questions or you made a decision, Victor couldn't see your hands from your home but we want to know about it because we can encourage you. Victor, I was getting messages from our media team of people that were sending in messages listening to you online. So many decisions. we got a lot of work to do. God bless you. We'll see you next time.